As I was hearing the word this morning, I just see the longing of the Lord to draw us near to him. He's saying, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And the Lord's longing is, like we heard this morning, is he wants us to know that he's approachable, that we can come to him any time with just as we are, come to us. And I see even with that verse that we, uh, uh, Olu had shared at the end, Psalm 62, 61, verse 2. Psalm 61, verse 2. It starts with verse 1, 60, uh, Psalm 61, verse 1. Hear my cry, O God. Give heed to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. The reason he was reaching out to God was because his heart was faint. He was in a situation where he's desperate. He needed some help. And whatever height that rock was, it was just high enough that he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't get to it. And so he says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And the Lord made the circumstance such that if it was just his right height, he would be able to do it on his own. But the Lord made sure it was a little higher than what he had. How, if he had to reach, he couldn't reach to it. So he had to climb up to the rock that is higher than I. And, and so I see that the Lord's longing is for us to come to him. And if it requires us to be in a circumstance where we're not able to do it on our own and we're desperate, the Lord will put us in that circumstance so that we'll have to reach up higher and go to him. And I was reminded of this uh, passage in Mark 5. You can turn with me. Mark 5, verse 25, a woman who had hemorrhage for 12 years, a woman for 12 years had a need, was desperate, and endured much at the hands of many physicians. She reached out. She wanted to go and get the different physicians to help her and spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. Could, could it not have happened where the physician helped her and she got better? No. The Lord made sure that none of the physicians would be able to help her. And why? So that it would become to a situation where she was so desperate. Verse 27, after hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she had thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. And I often think, like, why, why did this woman have to go through all that difficulty of 12 years, coming to that point where she was so desperate, and every place she turned to came short, came short, until the place where she was worse off than when she started off. It was because the Lord wanted her to come. She didn't want any other physician to come and help her. And it says immediately, the, verse 29, immediately the full flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately Jesus perceived in himself the power preceding him had gone forth. And he said, who touched my garments? And read verse 34, and he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. What a reflection you had emotionally, mentally, physically, be healed of it. She would have never got to meet with Jesus if she had not been able to come to a place of desperation where everything else that she was trusting on or depending on failed her and she had to reach to that rock that was higher than high. But if, she, if you were to go and ask her, after looking back at all these 12 years, would you trade that experience for anything else? I'm sure that she would have said no, because at the end of those 12 years of desperation, I met with Jesus, and he healed me of my affliction. I would not trade it. And so sometimes I see in our circumstances, the Lord leads us through different circumstances and situations so that we will go through all of those 12 years of affliction, but if it results at the end of us touching the hem of his garment and meeting with him, It'll be all worth it. And I was thinking as we were hearing this morning, the enemy knows that his time is short, days go drawn. 
The Christian life is compared to a marathon, a race. And the marathon is 26.2 miles long. The, the physical marathon is 26.2 miles long. And the devil is okay. If you, if you, even if you go 26 miles, he's fine. That last 0.2 miles, that's the part he doesn't want you to finish and cross that line. If you go as far as you want, he wants you to go as far as you want. Some people go 13 miles. Some people go 20 miles. Some also 26 miles. But what his concern is that you don't finish, that the last 26, that last 0.2 miles is what he's, 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 he's concerned about. And like we heard, it's not going to be necessarily gross sin. It's going to be things where we, we read again, Matthew 27, Matthew 7, I'm sorry. Turn with me to Matthew 7. Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to the wise man who built his house on the rock. We heard this this morning. But the verse before that, which we also heard, and they will declare to him, I never, what? I never knew you depart, depart from me who practice lawlessness. So what we heard here today that we were supposed to act on was the Lord says, I want you to know me. That's what we heard. When we go back after this meeting, we heard about knowing him, but if we leave this meeting and then we don't go and know him, we're going to be just like these men. You heard it. We all heard it. I heard it. Ajay, I want you to know me. And then I go back and I get distracted by all these other things. The last 0.26 miles, all of these other distractions. Aren't you feeling so tired and weary? Come on, take a rest here. Stop. Don't finish the race. Come here. Look at all these people. They're eating, they're eating lunch. Come. And in our spiritual life also, that last 0.2 miles, there's going to be all the distractions, social media. And for each one of us, we know how much of a distraction it is, and we know how much we've heard about it. Week after week, we've heard about the distractions of social media, playing games and watching t things on video and all of those things. We've heard of it. It's not that we haven't heard of all these distractions. But in these last 0.2 miles, it's all going to come there. And we're going to be, oh, it's just one five-minute video, or it's one five-minute scroll here. It's not going to be that one five-minute scroll. <laughs> it's going to be more than that. And I wanted to end with, close with this. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 5. Exodus chapter 5. We heard that word busy this morning. And this is what I, I was thinking about. You know that the Pharaoh is a picture of Satan in the Old Testament. It says here in verse 3, uh, Hebrew, Exodus 5, 3, Then he, they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. They wanted to go and meet with the Lord. They wanted to go there. And in the wilderness, they would have gone and met with the rock that we heard of, the rock out of which the waters would flow. They were supposed to go there. But what did the Pharaoh say? But the king of Egypt said, verse 4, Moses and Aaron, why do you draw the people away from their work? I've got them busy with so many other things. Why are you taking them to go and worship and meet with this rock in the wilderness? And the Pharaoh said, look at the people in the land are now many, you would have them seized from their labors. Verse 6. So the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters over the people and said to their foremen, Say, you are no longer to give the people straw to make brick as previously. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the quota of bricks that they are making previously, they should not impose them. You shall impose them. You shall not reduce any of them. Any, the exact same tally of bricks should be there at the end of the day. What's the reason? Because they're lazy. Therefore, they cry out, let us go sacrifice to our God. Let their labor be heavier on the men and let them work as sit so that they will not pay, pay attention to the false words. What were the false words? The false words were to go and meet with the Lord. Don't let them, don't let them think about going and meeting with the Lord. Keep them busy. Keep them occupied so that they won't, their mind won't go to go and say, I need to seek the Lord. So, 
May the Lord help us. May the Lord help us and go and so that we can meet with the Lord and that we be aware of his schemes and we're not distracted by them. We constantly bear aware that each one of us will finish our course, especially the last point two miles. May the Lord help us. Amen. Thank you, brothers. Um, <clears throat> I um, think it's good for us to read Psalms, Psalm 61 again, uh, 1 and 2. Something that has helped me over the last several years. Psalm 61, 1 and 2. Hear my cry, O God. Give heed to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I call to you. When my heart is faint or my heart is overwhelmed, so lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Um, and this is something that has really been uh, helped to me throughout these last several years, um, especially since... Um, what happened here several years ago um, where this verse uh, and even another verse just came clear to me about my rock and the foundation of where my life was or where it was and church had been one of the main staples of my life from when I was young as, since as, I can, as far as I can remember uh, my parents kept us in church. It was a stability in my life, and it it was just always there. Never thought of life without it. Um, but when what we went through last or or several years ago, there was a, a insecurity that came into my life that I never really felt before, and I didn't know what to do with it. I I didn't understand why I didn't why I was feeling that way. Where I just felt like I couldn't get my bearings. Um, and that insecurity um, was uh, consuming, was kind of all consuming. I just couldn't, it just me it messed me up, really. And I just didn't show it or, or try to use, you know, religious language to cover it up. But nevertheless, it was there. Um, but the Lord had to show me that he was my rock. Um, he had to lead me to the rock that was higher than I. Um, and in Joshua, um, something that the Lord uh, uh, showed me uh, during that time in five, uh, Joshua, I believe it's the fifth chapter. <clears throat> And 13 said, it's now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? He said, no, rather, indeed, come now. I indeed come now as captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, what has my Lord to say to his servant? Um, and, and during that time of trials, uh, in the trial even of my faith, um, the Lord came, my rock came and spoke just to my heart um, and told me basically is not whose side are you on or whose side, what, what side should you pick, what, investigation and investigate this one and that one and then get all the information and then make an informed decision on uh, where you should go or what you should do. Um, but it is rather that who's on the Lord's side, who's on the rock side, is that where you're going to build? And, and that gave me tremendous uh, hope because this is where he led me and that's what gave me rest, a tremendous rest in my heart, that rock that, he, that I was led to 
brought me uh, security in my life. And that is something that I've, that I've, been, I've been holding on to since then, that God is my foundation. I, uh, and as much as I love the church and I love God's people where he brought me to, um, but there could be a time where I won't have the church. It could, persecution could come and I'd be in jail. What then? Or I may be incapacitated, can't come, or whatever the situation may be. Those things may not be there. But if I stand on Christ, my rock, the one who never changes, the one who never, um, there's no shadow of turning in him. Um, and in Second Corinthians uh, 4, Second Corinthians four, seventeen and eighteen. It says, "For momentary light afflictions is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond comparison. While we look not at the things which are not seen, which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are temporal, things which are seen are temporal or temporary." But the things which are not seen are eternal. I used to think that my light afflictions, my momentary light afflictions were or my afflictions that I was going through were momentary and they were light automatically. Uh, that uh, if I'm a child of God and if I go through these different things, God is going to bring me out automatically. But this scripture says for a momentary light affliction, what makes them momentary, they're momentary, they're light. And. For them to produce for me something eternal, a weight of glory far beyond comparison, it only happens while I look or while we look, not at the things which are seen. So if I'm looking at the things of eternal, that's when those things that I'm going through are working for me. But if I'm looking at the things that are going on, the things that are that can change, anything that I can see is subject to change. It, it just that's just the nature of things. But if I'm looking at those things, it stopped working for me. Those light afflictions, momentary, I'm just, just like an unbeliever. I'm just, I just got to make it through the best way I can and uh, live and learn and all these different things like that. Time will heal the wounds and all these different cliches that they use. But if I continue to look to God, uh, what are you showing me, Lord? What are you? What is the purpose of this? Or I'm um, continue to look at you. Uh, you do all things well. If I continue to look at the, those things which are uh, which are not seen, that's when those things work for me. So while we look, look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And the last verse is Hebrews 12. Um, Um, in 22, 27 and 28, uh, Hebrews 12, 22. But we have come to Mount Zion. We've come to, to the rock, to Jesus, uh, and to the city of the living God, to heaven, Jerusalem, and to a myriad of angels. Uh, and it goes on down, says, actually in the 24, it said, and to Jesus Verse 24, the media of a new covenant, we've come to him and to the sprinkling blood, sprinkling, sprinkled blood, excuse me, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. And if you come down and, and go down to 27, this expression yet once more denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken from from eternity, uh, living for the things of eternity, let us show gratitude uh, by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. And then 29, for our God is a consuming fire. Uh, and that is something that has been near to me and something that has helped me in my, Christ my Christian life uh, is that God is my rock, and to build on that rock, as we were saying, um, the, those things that are eternal. Um, and while I keep, as we were saying, while we're, I'm distracted, I, I admit I get distracted by so many different things. As as uh, I J was saying that that five minutes 
scrolling turns into this rabbit hole that you just keep going down different places. And it could be something good. Um, uh, but I want to continue to live uh, for the things of eternity, even the things that, um, even about what's going on in the world. I, the Lord has to check me and say, okay, that's enough. You know, you, uh, this one said this about that, and that one said this about that. And, and then after a while, you just, it's, we all, I know that that can happen, but I want to continue to live for eternity. And I want this to be true in my life that that I won't always be led to the rock that is higher than I and can keep my eyes on those things that are eternal. Uh, those things that can change, they, they will change. It, it has to change. It's the nature of things. But beyond that, to Mount Zion, to Jesus, our mediator, we continue to look to him as our rock and, and to continue to build on that as we've heard before.